in search of soil. So Francesco, within the world of biochar, what would you say is your claim to fame or what are you known for? What would you like to be known for within that world? Well, here on the Olympic Peninsula, it's, it's really promoting and working with citizen scientists. It's to get biochar into the ground. And um, yeah, it's really working with the individual and, and educational uh, workshops, have a business where I sell it, but it really is passionate about getting biochar into the ground. And one thing that I use and occasionally is, you know, don't let perfection get in the way of putting biochar in the ground and, and promoting the local citizen scientists, local users, because there's so much, um, information out there about what's being done and research. And it's the local people that really jazz me in that what they're doing with it and what they're experiencing it from it. Um, so I'd, I'd say that's it, is really letting people know that it's not mysterious. It's not something that it's out there that somebody else do. Um, you can make it yourself. It's simple. You can buy some, um, play with it, have fun with it, and to help regenerate the soil and work with work um, work with climate change. Have a, as a solution for climate change. That's for me. That's important. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's getting getting everyone to use it. How um. How do you see the citizen scientists fitting into the greater piece of research? I like to consider myself a citizen scientist doing trials. I think there's good and bad to citizen science. You get people that maybe just make claims without doing all their testing, yet there are a lot of people doing really good research and you can't rely on academia to do it all. How do you view being a citizen scientist? I view it as someone, especially when one is working with biochar, and if they're working in a garden, whether they have their own garden or they're working in a community garden, put it in the soil, see what's going on, and use your knowledge, some of the most, use your knowledge of the way the soils work, what's good for your plants, and every plant is different. Um, in that, what, what does it need? What nutrients does it need? How does it work? Start small, small. And I think that role is driving, can help drive academia and real science. By that, I mean, um, I have seen examples through the years, having worked with biochar now for going on, you know, nine, 10 years, examples of, um, established science, research science, university science, going down path trails that citizen scientists have drawn them, is brought them back. And I think the role of citizen scientists say is we're observing this. Why? Let them, let citizen science be the driver for, um, for academia. And I don't we I don't know why. And, and there's so much that academia is learning today as far as soil, as far as the interaction between microbes, mycelia, bacteria, that there's an old Da Vinci, you know, Da Vinci quote that we know more about the heavens above than the soil beneath our feet. And that's true today. We're learning daily more of those interactions. And so I think citizen scientists, they intuitively, intuitively know or by observation um, what works and what doesn't work. And will biochar work in what they are doing? Um, so that's what I think the role of citizen scientists is that as long as you're not, they're doing no harm, and it's especially if someone that's growing their own food, they're not going to go out there and actively do harm. Yeah, I think it's as simple as you, you do some trials. One plant gets this, one plant doesn't get it. What do you see? And I don't 
think enough people do that. I think there's just too much blind following out there. Uh, somebody says to do this, so I do it. And then they don't see results or they, they don't have a control to compare against. So they can't tell if they actually see results or not. And then they say, well, it didn't work or it works great, but they don't really know either. Exactly. And I've seen examples of citizen scientists with a community garden that I work with. Well, we started off with a research, a, a, a friend that works biochar that's been a biochar compatriot for years. We helped set up a trial in three different beds. So where we did a control native soil, biochar and compost, biochar compost and mineral balancing. And the, the joy of working with citizen scientists, and I, I heard it just on a, on a webinar just the other day, was that after one season, the people in this community garden, it hurt their hearts to see the natives and what how the plants were struggling in the native soil. And they just added biochar and compost to everything, which totally blew the research. And that's okay. It was the citizen scientists, and we've 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 done soil tests and showed the increase in in carbon content in in carbon extent and CEC cation exchange. But that's citizen scientists, and we have to um, just be accepting that citizen science are going to do what they're going to do. It's they're not getting paid to follow a protocol. And it, the blind following of <clears throat> of things that someone has heard can can be an issue. And that it's like they hear and, and we see today often this instant gratification. Biochar is not a fertilizer. And so people will throw biochar in and say, we didn't get results. And I've seen university researchers do this. We didn't get results. Well, they didn't work with the biochar, understand the properties of the biochar. Biochar is not a soil amendment in and of itself. And that's important to remember. Do you think that's maybe where the reductionist mindset gets in the way of, I, I apply this and I, I just want to try and quantify it down to a said result. But maybe within some of these realms of soil, we, we don't understand it enough if you don't understand what's going on in your system to start with, if you don't understand what you're adding to the system, when you combine them, if you don't know about either one fully, you can only measure what you can measure. But you may be missing stuff or factors in the experiment that you thought you had accounted for that aren't even playing a role in it because you just you don't fully get what you're taking on. And, and I think that's where there's potentially a lot of error around this is like you said, um, I've talked to Gloria Flora about this in biochar and she talked to somebody at a university who did a study and they, they did an inefficient test in her mind. They didn't fully understand the properties of that biochar, what temperature it was produced at, what the material was. And they just applied it in a certain way and they didn't see the results. And they said, okay, well, here's the results. But she's like, well, you're missing a whole bunch of stuff here. So you didn't really do an accurate test. Most, most definitely, because all biochars are not created equal. Um, there is the variation of what was the feedstock one used? What temperature was it, was it made at? How was it quenched? How did one activate the biochar? Um, the interrelationship of, what, what of the life that one has in the soil that they're working with. And... This is, this is, a, the, we, it's easy to miss things and it's easy just to study, to look at we can, the path of, of what, what I love is conventional farming, which is an application of um, NPK and say, that's all a plant needs. And we're learning to understand it's not all a plant leaves. So I agree. It, it's, we end up, it's easy just think that we're studying studying something that's really going to be the end all and it's really not we may be missing something how, how would you define biochar i, I and i pulled up because it's a little blurb that we have and I'll, I'll read this and then go out um biochar is a carbon rich product 
um, product of a process called pyrolysis, which is the heating of a dry biomass to temperature to high temperatures in an oxygen limited environment. Biochar is long lasting. Uh, for example, in Amazonian uh, biochars have been carbon dated five to eight thousand years. Um, and so, it needless to say, biochar is being used used to grow plants is not uh, currently gaining steam as an important ingredient in the global regenerative agriculture movement. That's a little blurb that we hand out when people ask about biochar and how to activate their biochar, why it's important in gardens. Biochar is, is it's a type of charcoal. It's not biochar until it's biologically active. Um, and there are many different properties of, of different types of biochar. Uh, I have seen myself when I make biochar myself, I personally have made biochar from um, scraps from tree trimmings, from uh, pine cones, from cow dung, from cat poo, uh, made all these different biochars, and they're all different different properties. But it's any, it's the carbon that's left after the pyrolytic process, and depending upon what the source is that you can have biochars that have anywhere from a 40% carbon content to well over 80% carbon content. And that's, that's important to know. And it has different soil properties. So it's essentially carbon. And one other thing, it's a carbon that is called a recalcitrant carbon, which is a very hard, long-lasting carbon because all the volatiles have been cooked off, burned off. So, for example, if I leave a, a, a branch to rot, it will rot its carbon, and that carbon will be beneficial, but those volatiles, many of those volatiles, will off-gas and release the atmosphere. Biochar, when you use this pyrolytic uh, process, you retain about 50% of the carbon that would normally get released to the atmosphere retains bound up in the biochar. So that was a long answer, but. You know, in a, in a biochar, I think it, people think pure carbon. So if it's anywhere from 40 to 80% carbon and there's X left, what's that X made out of? What's What's else is in there besides that carbon that you're adding to the soil? What's left in the, um, in, in it? Yeah. So Again, there are there are some minerals. Um, depending on depending on how one produces it, you may have traces of polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which different um, in the concentrations one has, or the the microbes will eat those, the bacteria will eat those. Um, so there are different trace traces that are in that are left are left in there. For somebody looking to to do this, adding the carbon to the soil in this recalcitrant form. So it's not going to be food for microbes right away. They're not going to go in and try and digest this. Fungi aren't going to go after it right away. I'm putting carbon in the soil, which is beneficial for a few reasons as I see it. You're taking carbon out of the atmosphere and you're sequestering it in the soil. But there's other benefits happening in the soil and I'll let you speak on that. So when you put that carbon down, you tie it up from going into the air. What's happening in the soil? How are you getting benefit from that compared to, say, compost carbon, which becomes a microbial food source? Excellent question. And thanks for directing it a little. The biochar, and if anyone who watches this, I would suggest they would just do a Google search on, on images, biochar. And look and see what the biochar looks like under an electronic microscope. You'll you'll come up with you'll you'll come up with that literally thousands of pictures of how you make it, different kilns. But the pictures under an electron microscope are very revealing. It's a honeycomb structure. Biochar in in itself. If I were to take and put a teaspoon of biochar and a teaspoon tablespoon in my hand of biochar. 
it would have the surface area of about a football field. It is an enormous surface area. It's more, more air, more space. It also absorbs moisture. It is that surface area in that space becomes a home for bacteria inhabit it. Mycelia, the bacteria is bacteria die and what they do there do in their life, mycelia then will go and take the nutrients. Biochar is negatively charged. So biochar will attract to itself positively charged ions. And for example, nitrogen, it will absorb nitrogen and when it's not absorb, adsorb. It's attached to the surface area of the biochar. And it makes it available to the bacteria, to the mycelia, to, to the roots then, to go to the plant. So that's the, the what, and, and moisture, it retains moisture. A, so one then will water less. It, it will improve, a, the poorer the soil, the bigger change you're going to see. However, it does improve both uh, duff, the, fl the fluffiness of your soil, uh, and it's more of this relationship between what the biochar does in the soil. One of the things it does is it's called, it has a negative car uh, priming effect. And this is something that they've only seen in the past few years. So for example, when one puts compost in the soil, that carbon, the organic matter in carbon, I mean in the soil, will break down and release to the atmosphere. And one can measure that. That's measurable from year to year. When one puts biochar into the soil, it works. It has a relationship with that label carbon, unlike the recalcitrant carbon. So the carbon of, of compost is a label carbon. It's more available to plants and will break down rather, you know, quicker. That label carbon, that relationship, this negative priming is, say, for example, one has start off with 100% just straight label carbon in the soil, compost carbon. After a year, these numbers are just, for example, after a year, you have 75%. After two years, you'll have 50%. If one has biochar in that soil with that carbon, then in the first year, you won't see as great a reduction. So your soil organic carbon is more stable and more long-lived. And those are some of the things that, that the biochar um, does in creating this healthy soil biome. And you're in one of the hotbeds of biochar, the Pacific Northwest. A lot of research is being done up there in, in universities and at the citizen scientist level. There's a lot of great practitioners up there, companies up there. You know, thinking about this integration of biochar into the soil, why has the Pacific Northwest and states like Washington looked at this as a tool to help guide the soil? Hmm. Interesting question. I think part of it may be because of the, um, the enormous amount of the forest industries that we have up here. Um, and the knowledge of, of seeing some of the effects of a healthy forest fire and the carbon that's left afterwards and, and looking at, at some of those systems. The, you know, it, it, it may be the, Part of it may be in, in some of the readings that I'm doing recently, and, and it's just personal reading of the connection to the soil, the connection to the land, uh, and this biochar is something that is 
it's just compelling when you start to look at and become aware of it. There's more research on it. And, and for example, in university researchers, there's a university researcher that I work with today. Well, I started doing some stuff about six years ago, and this university researcher was referred to me to possibly do, you know, participate in some stuff. And the university researcher said, and I won't divulge your name, but he said, you know, I really don't know anything about much about biotrust, so I'm really not your guy. And he was a university researcher with soils. Well, in the course of about six years, this university researcher has become one of the foremost researchers and experts on biochar. So that's how quick it can, ha- how quick it's happening. I think we're reaching a tipping point where the university researchers that are open to observing what citizen scientists, back to them again, are observing and what they're finding, they are compelled to start doing some research. And this researcher right now is doing a lot of research with compost and biochar. Can you talk about some of the trials that they've done and any results that you're aware of from those trials? Yeah, I'm... I'm I'll give one that that I'm I'm very aware of, and this is a university researcher, uh, uh, Washington State, with a researcher that's now moved over to Montana. But they've done multi-year trials with biotrol that they produce themselves using a flame cap kiln, which is a type of, which is one way to create the pyrolytic environment. And this was on organic farms on the San Juan Islands. Anecdotally, one had heard I had heard prior to seeing this research that biochar inhibits the leaching of nutrients, especially in the Northwest where we get substantial rains. Nutrients in the wintertime will leach from the soils. So what this research was, they they put the biochar in control where they had control and then with biochar, with biochar that was charged using beneficial microbes and seawater and, and different things. Um, and under the under the root zone of the of the plants, and they were drawing growing dry beans, under the root zone they installed these little capsules that would measure NPK. And after the growing season, when they took when they measured the, the amounts of NPK that had leached through the plants and through the root zone down to below the root zone, they found that the plants that had biochar had between 30 and 40% less NPK. So that was retained in the biochar in the root zone. It wasn't See, making was, its way down to the capsule. It, w- it wasn't making its way down to the capsule. It wasn't leaching out. And that was the first time, it may have been done before, but that's the first time that I saw university research. And it's, um, it's Washington State, um, not Washington State, University of Washington research that quantified this. They've continued to do several. They've done like three years worth of research. Um, and showing different um, over years and over years the 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 more the greater benefit that one gets. So that's one. Um, as a citizen scientist researcher, I was personally involved with a tomato grower here locally on the North Olympic Peninsula, just outside of Port Townsend. And one year, he agreed to do some trials with. Some biochar. He grows all his plants in 20 gallon pots in a greenhouse, all his tomatoes. And so he was willing to, to dedicate four pots to biochar mixtures with four different varieties of tomatoes. The first season, we activated, we charged the biochar, just simple. I charged it with worm tea for about a week just mixed it, stirred it in, and we put that in the soil mix. 
at a 10% uh, mixture. The results the first year after we were done, and I let, again, being citizen scientist, citizen science, I let the tomato grower really kind of, we talked of how he wanted to do it. In this first year, he treated both plants. He put uh, the same amount of moisture, the same amount of, of, of nutrients, fertilizer, for both the control and the biochar enhanced. At the end of the season, we looked at the results, and he measures the results by number of fruit. He doesn't, he doesn't weigh them. And he said, you know, I really didn't see much change, any, you know, any change. So let's revisit this next year if we're going to do it and what we're going to do. So the next year we, we, we came in and said, okay, so if we're going to do it, let's really stress the biochar plants. What he did in the control, he changed the entire soil. He took out the old, put in new. I said, in the biochar one, let's leave it exactly. We just took out the plant shook off all the soil from the roots and left it in there. We could still see the biochar there. And what the intention was to give it 50% less water and no fertilizer through the entire growing season. Well, being citizen scientists and he has volunteers come in, it was not 50% less, but it was substantially less, at least 40, probably 40% less. And nutrients through the course of the growing season, it got fertilized a couple of times, but much less than what his normal protocols are. When that season was over, he showed across the different the, set, the four different varieties of, of, of tomatoes a 17% increase in yield. And the biggest thing he had was no blossom and rot which is big, for, which is important for tomato growers. So he said, when he looked at that, he said, you know, I'm going to need to really kind of reevaluate. I've been doing the best. Unfortunately, he sold the tomato farm we haven't considered, but that was an example. Another organic farmer that I, that I worked with that uses, had, uses a different biochar, but he was originally from, from Wisconsin, and he was familiar with biochar from in Wisconsin, he grows all his tomatoes at his farm using biochar. Well, at our local farmer's market, and this isn't, you know, big research, but they do a, ta a blind taste test of tomatoes. And his tomatoes, one, I believe it was three out of the four categories for taste. And when I talked to Max about this, Max said, I said, what do you think that is? He says, I think it has to do tomatoes are very Besides the nutrients, tomatoes are very um, susceptible or de de to the amount of moisture. And the biochar gives them a constant moisture. So they don't run through that cycle of a lot of water, less water, a lot of water, less water. It's constant. So those are a couple of examples, a few examples of research, both, both university research and citizen scientists. Yeah, hearing this and, and thinking about a lot of what I've learned doing this series, already talking to people so far, is the big driver of plant growth, uh, one part of it, is the health of the community of microorganisms in the soil. So if you're adding biochar to the soil, you're not necessarily helping that plant directly per se. Like the plant is not going in and mining or doing anything with that biochar other than maybe taking some water that's maybe tied up in its matrix. So really what you're doing when you're adding biochar to the soil is you are amplifying or enhancing that biological community within the soil matrix. And that, if enhanced the right way, the optimal way for the plant you're growing results in better plant growth. That's that's how I see this chain of events. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it Exactly. You're facilitating a healthier soil biome. And there's been a lot of talk about soil, about biomes, both human biomes, soil biomes. And it's that, it's that 
that enhance soil biome where we have trace minerals available, where we have uh, a healthy um, a healthy bacterial life, mycelia, worms are important. And what worms do in, do in that? So yes, you're correct. It's the biochar in of itself isn't feeding the plants. It's feeding all those wee beasties, as you might want to call them, in the soil, creating a healthy soil biome, which then um, create healthy plants. Uh, I heard there is an author um, that has that has written a book and is is he's written was um, oh, it'll come to me. But his his newest books is going to be the he's talking about because there's the saying you are what you eat and it's what his the, his latest book that's going to be David Montgomery is the author is going to be coming out and he's looking at the title being you are what your plants eat. And so if that if that isn't available, if in, in the soil biome, healthy bacteria, health uh, uh, in those things that plants need to be healthy, nutritious, tasty, they won't end up in the in the food, in the plant, whether it be a leafy plant or, or a tomato, a bean. And that doesn't then trans transfer over to us. So yes, the biochar itself is just a means to assist in 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 growing a healthy soil biome. And while we're doing that, regenerating the soil because most of our soils have been so depleted for whatever reasons. And being this healthy skeptic that wants to believe, which is how I quantify myself here. I, I think maybe the issue we see around these things are we fully don't understand what's happening below ground in terms of soil biology. A lot of mainstream agriculture uh, either dismisses it or downplays it. So there's not a ton of research being done there to begin with. Now you're adding something a little further out on the curve to something that we already don't understand that well. And you're adding this other variable in that is potentially enhancing that environment and making it better. And now we have to try and say, well, how did it make it better? How does this affect the plant? And I, I do think it's just lack of understanding, or maybe it's time. Like You're not going to see results this season, or you might not see results next season. But if you looked at something like any soil built over 10 years or 20 years using a consistent... Uh, regenerative management method, you would definitely see results over time. Rotational grazing is a good example. Year one, you'll see some results, but 10 years later, if you compare them against year zero, you'll see dramatic results. And I, I think that's where biochar and some of these other things, maybe, I don't want to say they fall short, but they get shortchanged, is people want the instant result. They don't stick with it long enough to try. And yet, and we don't understand it fully to begin with. So it comes down to me when I think about this is I don't see a harm in adding it. Can you think of a negative of putting it into the soil? So let, let's forget any positive benefit. Let's say there's no positive. Is there a negative that you could have by putting it into the soil? Well, the... the I would do some. I would. I would suggest that if anyone is putting in, especially if they're putting in a, a biochar that they made themselves, to possibly be a little. There were this old test. This old that one would say, if you're going to test your biochars, um, it's called a worm avoidance test. And so, if you have a worm bin, and a lot of people have worm bins or they have compost piles in the corner. In one corner of the of your worm bin, dig out and put biochar. Just put a spoon, a cupful of biochar in there, or a, a shovelful, depending on how big it is. Go back a few days later. If the bio, if the worms have gone away from the biochar to the other side of your bin, 
then there's something wrong with your biochar. My experience, we have just a small backyard. I live on a very small lot, uh, less than 5,000 square feet, and I have a container compost that's open at, open at the bottom, but it's closed with the lid. And we started just kitchen waste. And we throw in biochar because I have a, a plentiful amount of biochar. That is, as over time, it is just teeming with worms with the amount of biochar we put in. Um, there are organizations, there's the, you, you, uh, the U.S. Biochar Initiative and the International Biochar Initiative. If anyone is going to get purchased biochar, then I would suggest that do your due diligence and find out if those biochars, commercially produced biochars, have been tested, ask the question, have they been tested per the IBI, the International Biochar Initiative, testing protocols? Because they, they've been working on this for, for decades now, for a decade at least. So say somebody does want to buy commercial biochar from your company or some other company. I mean, you even find it on Amazon these days. What should you be looking for either on writing, on the bag, the box, or on the website? If you're, say, growing a vegetable application, what characteristics do you want in that biochar to say, okay, this is one I want, or if you're deciding between two, well, this is what I don't want? I would look at, a, if one, again, I would ask the question, have you, do you have your te tests per the International Biochar Initiative soil classification, biochar classification? That will, and then ask for a copy of it. That will give you several things. It will give you carbon content, and the IBI has different um, qualities of biochar that starting as low as 40% up to over 80%. And from a premium biochar, it, it, I think it's, I believe if, if I'm correct, 40% you are considered to be biochar. But then there's different, 40, 40 to 50 is one grade. And a premium biochar is over 60%. Many of your many of your um, commercially produced biochars that are byproducts of um, cogeneration plants, and there's more and more of them coming online now. They will have carbon contents of well over eighty percent. And then look at your gradation, the fines, and a lot of those are you buying chunky biochar? Is it is it a self-produced have they graded the biochar in some way but the big thing is ask the question have you done testing per the international biochar initiative and then there are a couple of other tests because the international biochar initiative also has whether or not they're certified as have they done the testing for poly aromatic hydrocarbons pahs pcbs and dioxins those are tests that you send them, they're sent off to third party testing labs, certified laboratories, and measure those. And they have standards for those. I would ask those questions. I, I would not have even thought of asking those questions until I started working with a cogen plant in which I get their biochar. And before I put that biochar further on the market, I did my due diligence. So then when someone like you or someone wanted to purchase some biochar, I can say this is, it meets the parameters of the International Biochar Initiative. So knowing that they've done those tests and you could look at results, if you were using it for vegetables, would you choose something with a higher carbon content with a finer particle size? Yeah, a finer, you don't, yeah, you don't want fines, you don't want dust, although that that's okay. Um but yes, the finer particle side just makes it more workable. Um, if you have a big, because if I, when I use it, when I make it in a flame cap kiln or in a large top lit updraft stove, when I put in a, a, a two inch diameter chunk of bra a branch, I'll end up with about an inch and a half diameter chunk of wood. 
that looks exactly like the branch that I put in. You see all the rings, you see everything. Um, it's it's exactly that. that. That one can either crush up or not crush up. The soil will do the work. And if you live in an environment where you have a freeze-thaw cycle, the freeze-thaw cycle over a few winters will break up your larger pieces. But for, for a home gardener, someone that has a little bed or someone's going to use it in their, their um, raised bed or in, they're going to grow vegetables in pots like I do, the finer, the finer gradation is easier to use. Yeah. I mean, I've, I make mine at home quite a bit. I just kind of use it in a modified cone kiln. I smash it up with a shovel in there. I don't mind putting it on course. Personally, I figure eventually it's going to break up from walking on it, harvesting stuff out of it. I'm not too concerned about that. One thing I, I have had people comment when I've posted stuff about this on Instagram is the effect of biochar in the pH of the soil. People are really concerned that biochar carries a higher pH, meaning it's more alkaline. I was putting it on pretty heavy. They said, oh, you're going to drop the pH there. Uh, to mine, this is how I tested the pH because I'm making it at home. I'm not buying it from somebody, so I didn't have anybody to ask. I just put some in a jar, kind of crushed it up more, put water in, measured the pH of that water, it came out about nine. So two-part question. One, is that an okay way to measure the pH of the char? And what are your thoughts about biochar affecting the pH? Biochar, yes, it is alkal alkaline. And all bio and first of all, the answer to one question, yes, that's an acceptable way to do to, at home to measure your, measure your pH. Um, I know co commercial composters that will test their compost just using strips. Um, the you can see one can see biochars that have um, on the market that tests as high as you know a, a pH of ten or greater. Um, then others, depending on how the process that they made, the, the pHs may be lower. That is another function when one does the IBI testing; it will show what the bio what the pH is of that biochar. It's it's listed on the test. And then you have the, the sort of thing that with water, one of the ways to, to lower your pH is to rinse your biochar. So you'll lower, you, you, you can lower it and some of the fines, it, leak the pH, it will leach out. So over time, it will balance and you're not putting in, you're not growing plants in a straight biochar media. Right. So it, it balances out over time that pH. Uh, and I've heard that blueberries of, are susceptible to pH. They don't want a high pH. Yet I, there are examples of blueberry growers that are using biochar and having good results. Yeah. So it is, know what you're putting in. And again, if we start off back to what we do, do a little trial. How does it work? Is it hindering the kale that you're planting, the one plot versus the other, or the lettuce, or the carrots, or whatever you're growing? And do your own, do one's own due diligence. And in, in, in this time, in, in this time where we're at, if we start, if I start getting more of a relationship with the soil, a relationship with with what is is alive with life. It's going to be better for me in the long run. Yeah. In the way so, I think, but, the, yeah. The way I think about the pH too is, it's not like you're adding lime to a soil where you apply water that instantly, you know, can lower the pH. You're applying something that has some ash residue on it that will slowly leach off over time. So you're not. It's not like you're releasing all that alkalinity into the soil at one point in time to shock the surrounding soil. Maybe in a vacuum, the biochar itself is alkaline. You are diluting it, and then you got to figure, okay, well, how much of that alkaline producing ash and material on the char is going to release at any given time into the water? I just haven't seen a big problem, and I've applied it heavy 
I have videos on this where I've done it, where I've I've put down a carpet, like I've taken a bed and I've carpeted the bed with a char. So like edge to edge, length to length, pour it on like an inch thick and then put soil on top. I've planted a cover crop on top of that and I've had cover crops five feet high growing on it within months after doing it. So that that's where the citizen science in me, the antidotal, what I'm observing is saying like, it's not a negative, whether it's a positive. Okay. We can debate a lot of that, but I personally, like I'm not seeing a lot of the negative effect from it. So then it comes down to a time money, more of a resource trade-off. Do you want to spend the money? Do you want to spend the time making it? I get those things might preclude you from using it, but I don't see a negative in terms of adding it to the soil itself. No, and, and what you described, I, I agree completely. And what you described, your method of incorporating a biochar to your beds, where you put it in, you cover it with soil, then you put a cover crop. What you're allowing the biochar to do is to let, I have a, a dear friend, first person that, that really looked at the biochar that I had and said, hey, I want this. How much can I get of this? You know, and, and he says, I'm a, I'm a lazy farmer. Let nature do the work. And that's what you just did. That's what you just described was putting it in, covering with some soil, putting a cover crop. The roots will go down. The life from below the biotrol will come up and it all mixes together. And that is the healthy soil biome we talked about before. So that when that cover crop, I, I don't know if you do a, a minimal till or a no till, but that's another, if you leave the root zone in there and don't disturb that much, then that's, to me, that's the ideal because that life that you've created in the soil is there and ready to give to whatever plants you plant in that. So yeah, you just, you describe the way that I would tell people, if you have the time, the best way to do it that's one of them. The other way to incorporate your biochar is I always ask the question, do you have a compost pile? And invariably the, the, the answer is yes. Then mix it in with your compost. Mix it in 5 to 10% by volume. And what that biochar will do, it, it, number one, it enhances the composting process. It also minimizes the greenhouse gases that are normally emitted during a compost, mainly nitrogen, and it makes that those those that nitrogen available to the plants. And what you you've also done is by you putting it in your soil and letting it work over the, over a, a winter and with a cover crop. When the compost is ready, the biochar is charged, and it's very, it's it's just, that to me, those are the two simplest ways of putting the biochar into your, incorporating it into your garden, into your soils. One concern I had somebody voice on a YouTube comment, and I never thought about this before, and it seems valid to me. You let me know what you think, especially being in the Pacific Northwest where there's been a lot of industry, paper mills, I don't know if there's been smelting up there, saying... Trees are long-lived. They're absorbing a lot of nutrients out of the air. If you have a tree growing for a long time and it's absorbing pollution from the air, say it's downwind of, of some of the activity that happened pre-1980 where there's a lot of smelting activity and, and like EPA restrictions were a lot less than they are today, that wood would potentially have sequestered in it heavy metals, bad things. Now you're taking that wood, you're burning it, and you're not volatilizing those heavy metals, but you're now just concentrating them into a char, which you're putting into the soil. You are then growing food in. Do you have a worry around that? Or have you ever seen I, anything on that? Yeah, I, I've, seen, I've seen questions around that. And again, I'll, I go back to, especially for a commercially produced by a char, um, look at the tests. And personally, the biochar that I work with, 
uh, that I, besides stuff people that make their own and helping them make their own, is harvested from the um, it's hog fuel. It's hog fuel is when a, when a when a tree comes into a mill to be processed, either in chips or as lumber or whatever. The first thing they do is they take off the outer layers, and and so that they have the pure wood underneath. That outer layer is hog fuel. The so the bio truck I work with, to give an example, it has that, and then it also it also is about two thirds that, and it's one third construction and demolition debris, which is certified to be no lead based paints and no treated lumber. Now I've run several it's several over, over multi years, every few years I'll run a test, and the concentrations of the of the metals that are tested per the International Biochar Initiative are well below, well below anything that is it, it considered harmful. So I don't, I don't have an, I don't have an issue with that because one of the questions, one of the questions that one needs to raise is when you put those, when you put the biochar in the soil, what does what do the microbes interact with and what do they, the microbes and the mycelia, the bacteria, what do they eat and transmute into something else? So how is, if we have X amount of metals in there, what's the concentration of those metals if one were to take a measurement when one initially puts everything in, if one takes a measurement a year later, two years later, is there a difference? And then all those metals taken up by the plants and all those metals then taken up into the fruit of the plants. So personally, I don't, I don't have an issue with, with, I mean, I would not use treated lumber. I would not use something with lead-based paints. Yeah. Um, but other than that, when I make biochar myself out of out of scraps of material and stuff, I'll sometimes I, I store firewood on on wood pallets. Sometimes after a couple of years, I pull those pallets out. Some of the wood is rotten. Some of the wood is is still good, and I just pyrolyze it well and make biochar. Right. Yeah, and I think it, you know it, where are you making it? People making it on a home scale, homestead level. A lot of times they have brush around, you know, you know, probably if your site used to be a, a foundry or some other commercial site, if you know it's never been that or zoned industrial, well, then you know, okay, the stuff growing on it probably isn't absorbing heavy metals from the soil, from activity on that soil. Maybe there was some stuff drifted in, but then I could make the argument that stuff's already in the soil anyway, you know? And it's probably already in your food already because it's drifted into the soil. It's in the soil, and it's if the plants right. uptake it, then it's there. I and mean, yeah, so yeah. In terms of application rate, what are your thoughts on that per square foot or per hundred square foot basis for people who want to get started in this? If they're buying some, a lot of times you see it sold in small bags. Maybe that's a gallon size. How much should you start with? So you are kind of balancing that cost to getting enough in there to matter ratio. Well, I think whatever one gets in there will matter over over time. The the some of the rates goes back to if, and I'm sure you've seen it, but one looks at Terra Preta de Indio when the researchers and the people that are actually be working with behind the International Biochar Initiative and researchers, Johannes Lehman from Cornell University, back in 2008, I believe it was, they went to um, they went to the Amazon, and where they they looked at these uh, biochar enriched soils, these charcoal enriched soils. What they found at that time was some um, some rates of, you know, they they measured the carbon. 20%, and so there's been talk about 20%, and I think 20%, 20%, 20 
I think for an initial application, I mean, if you're making it all yourself and you want to do it, fine. I, I think that personally would be a little bit high. Um, I recommend rule of thumbs, rule of thumb. If you're talking about in the top six inches of soil, if you wanted a 10% by volume biochar, that would be roughly 40 gallons per 100 square feet. That would be for 10%. Um, that can be expensive if you're buying it yourself. Then the other one is, so I say, and if you start off with, start off with less. If you put in 5%, that's 20 gallons per 100 square feet. That's sufficient to get things going. And even less than that is sufficient. But 20 gallons per 100 square feet, usually, you know, I'll, I'll usually work with, work with that with people I'm working with. Um, so that's a good rule, rule of thumb. 5% is 20 gallons per 100 square feet. 10% is 40 gallons per 100 square feet for by volume measurement in the top six inches of your soil. And if you're putting biochar in your compost, then put in a five to 10% because most compost, especially if you're using kitchen scraps, that will break down by volume. So if I start off with even commercial composters, they'll start off with a large pile that say is 100 cubic, yard, 100 cubic yards. And after the composting process, it will have shrunk down to maybe 60 cubic yards. Well, if they put in, if say, just for rule of, just for conversation, for ease of, ease of math. So if you put in 5% biochar in 100 cubic yards compost pile. And at the end of the compost price process, you have 50 cubic yards. The biochar hasn't shrunk down. So that 5% by volume is 10% by volume. So you can put in less in your compost and end up with a higher volume composition of your, of your biochar. But those are the numbers that I normally use. There's been a couple of ways you've talked about producing it in a, uh, I'm blanking on the first one, cap. Um, flame flame cap kiln. Yeah, a flame cap kiln, um, a, a top lit updraft Up stove. stove. I mean, people, you can do them in cone kilns. What are your thoughts on production methodology versus final results. Like I use a cone kiln that's open top and I've had some people say, well, you're not going to get as good of results out of that is the kind where, and again, I don't, I can't remember the name I'm blanking on right now where you have like a smaller vessel that you pack with wood. You put that inside another a vessel, retort. a retort and you light around that. Are you going to see different results going from a kiln to a retort? You know, you will see some different results. I have a dear friend that does a lot of work using large flame cap kiln, not flame cap, but using large uh, top lit updraft stoves. So it's not a retort, but it's a flame propagation and you drive, drive off the volatiles. And he is just now, he's never submitted his biochar for any of this testing. He has, he has excellent biochar. But just to see for himself, he's going to start submitting this. I know flame cap kilns, especially the cone kilns, which are Contiki. The Contiki kiln is is a you know a premier uh, flame, uh, flame cap kiln. That's what it is. It's a cone kiln, and there's been a lot of research in it sent in, and it has it has excellent properties. I like to say. It's a function of the, the, the feedstock and the operator. So if you have someone that, if you've got a feedstock, how dry is your feedstock? And this also goes into how much smoke one creates. How much, it, and if, so if you have a dry, in, in the area where I live, we're lucky, even at the end of the summer, 
to end up with feedstock that maybe has a 15% moisture content. We're lucky if we get that low. Um, flame cap kilns are forgiving in that you can burn, you can you pyrolyze um, feedstock that has a higher moisture content. It will take longer. It may smoke a little, but what this, most of the smoke that's coming off is the, the gas, the water being put off. And you can tell um, there are, there's been some interesting just by visually of how do you put it in? How the color of the flame? Are you are you redu are you producing a lot of methane or little little methane? And I'm sure you've seen in yourself the different the different colors of your flame when you add material versus when it's just it's it's more it's just pyrolyzing almost completely. So um, you will end up with different different results depending on what one uses. But I'll go back to what I said early on. Um, it's biochar, and don't let perfection get in the way of putting, producing and or putting biochar in the ground. Do you think using too small of feedstock results in uh, more ash because it just burns too quickly? Say you use rice hulls or even cow manure i'm curious on so you have herbaceous material there that you're burning does the ash to char ratio get too high well it get you get to again it's it's the operator and it's the it's what one's using there are it's, there are somebody's top lit updraft stoves if one were to look at rice hull gasifiers there's work in the Philippines with um, one gentleman, uh, Paul Bellino, Dr. Bolonio, that has done, I mean, they use rice gas, rice husk uh, gasifiers commercially in bread making plants. And it burned, they burn very efficiently. And it's the function of the stove and the operator of don't let it pyrolyze to ash. When I use... In my little gasifier stoves, when I go out and do workshops, I'll use wood pellets just because they're uniform and I get a really good burn in this very small stove that's 27 ounces. It's one that's made out of uh, soup cans and tomato cans. And it's knowing what the fire is doing. Once that fire dies down and it'll start to smoke, I quench it, I put it out. And I get no ash. If I were just to leave it, it's like a charcoal barbecue. All the charcoal that's left will turn to ash. So, yes, would depend the feedstock, the rate of application, and how one one pulls out the feedstock when one stops and one stops to burn and puts in other material, puts in new material one will create more ash and yes a, a more straw will create more more of an ash straw would also create a lower carbon content straw will be a less uh, recalcitrant it won't be as long lived so it depends on the feedstock does does um, affect the properties of the biochar that is created now, I know this is might be tough without visuals but Let's say you're at a workshop and, and giving people tips on being a good operator. What are some things you really want to watch for when you're feeding feedstock into, let's just use a cone kiln, for example. Well, a, a cone kiln, there's, there's a couple of ways of how one starts a cone kiln. One can either fill it all up and start it on top and let it burn down. I prefer where you start a little fire in the bottom and start adding material. And so as that material one looks, you get your little, you go like any fire, you get it started with smaller material, with your kindling and you come to bigger, but say your fire is going now. By visually you look at that fire, when it looks as though you can see that the flames have died down, it's like a charcoal barbecue burning now. 
And then you start to see ash forming. Add your next layer. You will then get some smoke come off and you'll get more, more flame because that heat from below is what is driving out the volatile gases in the, in the material you've just added. And because of the design, as you know, of a cone kiln, there's no air coming in from below. The only air comes over the top. So you're creating that, that oxygen-starved environment. And when you look at it, you'll see that the flames are not on the material. The flame is actually above the material. The flame, and as you come up, the flame is actually at the top of your cone. Because that's where the gases rise, the oxygen that comes over the top mixes with the gases and ignites. Again, so watch that flame go down. The flame comes down to the charcoal that's left, the biochar. Add your next layer and let it burn. And another rule of thumb is you add so that you fully burn everything, char everything, is that in the middle of your burn is where you add your larger materials. And if you have a large, a large uh, Contiki kiln that's maybe four or five foot in diameter, you'll be adding, you could be adding feedstock that's two, three inches in diameter in that middle of that burn. As you get towards the top, then start reducing the size again so that it gets fully pyrolyzed and fully turned to char to bio to charcoal before you quench it. So it's the visual. And I'll give one example of it's our relationship and it's the operator's relationship with the fire, with the stove, kiln, whatever they're using. Um, I worked with a group called C Char with an art Donnelly. And C-Char would build some, um, some top-lit updraft stove tea luds out of five-gallon pails that were, and he was using them in Costa Rica for migrant workers, farmers that were picking cacao beans and coffee beans. And this was going to be, and they were making biochar. So Art went down at one of his, at one of his, and we brought these down. He was working with some, with an NGO down there. He was an NGO. And he had the stove and he was demonstrating to the women because it's women that do the cooking in, in Costa Rica. And so it's been the, the thought that you can't add what a top lit you put in your one load and you don't add any materials afterwards. Well, the cookers, the women that are using, operating these stoves are doing it. And then all of a sudden, they kind of lifted the lid and they started to put more material in. And Art was going to say, no, don't. And he just backed off. And he let them do what they do, even though they were using a new stove. And Art said, they, they did things with that stove I did not think was possible. And what I learned that day is they have a relationship with fire that I will never have because they cook three meals a day over fire. And so whether it's, I'm sure from the very first burn you did with your cone kiln to where you are today, your relationship with fire is becoming more part of you. And so your experience of what you do it is, is, you know, practice. There's, it's practice. You know, it's practice makes perfect. Yeah. And it's, I think there's something within us that just has this intrinsic connection to fire. I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of years in our DNA. And I think a lot of that gets lost now with people living in cities. You know, the, the closest you might come to a fire is lighting a candle these days or, you know, striking a lighter. And when, when you start a fire, there is just something romantic. It just feels cool. Like my Saturday morning ritual, I try to every weekend as I get up before the sun is up and I start that kiln now and I go have a fire. And it's, I look at it like, okay, when I'm making biochar, sure, 
it might help the soil. If it does, great. I don't think there's a negative, as I discussed before. But a big part of the making it for me is like, it's fun for me and kind of relaxing to step away from the screens, to just make a fire, to manage the fire. And if that's all the benefit I got out of it, and I'm just left with this char afterwards, like for me, that's enough. I realize that isn't everybody, but I think there are some special experiences, like you said, when you do this a few times, Fires are addicting, and, and I don't mean in a um, in a pyromaniac lighting buildings on fire type of way, but in this kind of soulful way, there is something about burning that fire and looking into that fire that just, there's a lot of mystery there, and there's a lot of us in there. I, I, yeah, I have to agree with you completely with that, and this personal experience. I mean, you know, we're doing this right in the middle of this whole COVID lockdown and everything else. Um, in the beginning of it, there's a friend who has a large Contiki kiln that's a few miles away. And I was going to do a workshop and he was going to bring his kiln back and it was on March 7th, I believe. And we, we had to postpone. I chose, we didn't have to, I chose to postpone that workshop. Um, well, a few weeks later, later in March, maybe, maybe in, in April, um, he got in touch with me and he said, his name is Leon. Leon said, you know, I'm out on my property and I'm going to do a burn. I'm going to do my kill. He said, you want to get out here? You want to, you want to come on out? And I says, I need to get out. Yes. And we went out and he was using very wet material that he had, but he had started. I mean, I went out mid uh, mid morning. He had already started early in the morning and he burned hours after I left. And I was out there for about four or five hours and it's that whole just being with it and talking and 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 that that relationship. And the other gentleman that I talked about uh, just recently that I've known for years that works with Biochar lives about 30 miles from here. Um, we just contacted each other recently. He says, you know, I've got this 21-year-old mentee that is really into things. We're going to be doing a bunch of burns and maybe you ought to get over. And my response to his, let me know when. I could use a few hours of just hanging with you and your young mentee being with the fires. Um, it's not for everybody. However, I mean, I don't know a person who doesn't like standing around a campfire. And if you're using a flame cap kiln, it's a campfire that's producing a lot less smoke than a campfire. Yeah, and if you do it when it's cold, all the better because now you're warm. Uh huh. Yeah, uh -huh. no, yeah, it, it is a cool kind of Zen experience. And the other thing I like about it is in today's day and age, it feels like we get on this treadmill of work of always doing the next thing. It's a process. You start the fire, you finish it. So you can, within a few hours, you get the enjoyment, but you did something and you see the result right away. It's tangible. Okay, man, I made something I can use like making a loaf of bread or something like that. So it is a cool experience. Along the tips that you had, I, I think one thing I had to learn was just what you said is instead of piling up the biomass, you're kind of layering it on like pancakes, stacking pancakes, slowly going up, creating uniform surface. And, and that way you get that more even burn. And like you said, once you just see that outer white coloring on, bam, next layer goes on. And, and with the cone kiln, I don't see any smoke. In fact, if you watch kind of even around the edges, you see these little vortices where the fire is drawing in the gas so anything trying to leak out the sides if there's no wind you'll see it actually curl back in where it's reburning it and just cycling it off so it's a very clean clean burn it's a very clean burn and then one thing that you that you alluded to and it's that you, that it's very zen um when i'm doing especially if i'm working with a flame cap kiln a cone kiln, I have to be present. I have to be mindful of what I'm doing. I don't have to be, but the fire will show me that I'm not being present because I'm off doing something else. I come back and I got a bunch of ash or I've put too much on and I have a bunch of smoke. And so backing away from being in the screen or being locked up on the screen or being locked up of coming to that moment of Zen, that moment of mindfulness, of being present with something. 
it's like I've it it's it really does it 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 nurtures me and I know it nurtures other people um and when I do when I do workshops and stuff the workshops where we can do actually do a burn and um that's the ones with the one where people really get off and that's where the real learning happens and the real discussion happens because when I'm standing there with a PowerPoint and explaining and whatnot, it's very, it's almost like teaching to a class. Yeah, there are there are a few people that ask questions, but when you're standing around a flame cap kiln, a large burner, that's where the learning happens. That's where everyone you'll notice. There's maybe if there are twelve people there, you'll have three different conversations going on at the same time, and everyone getting something. So, yeah, I agree. For somebody looking to start this at home and they don't have a kiln, they don't want to fabricate one because they're not sure if they want to get into it, do you think they can get good results out of just digging that cone out of the ground and doing the burn in that cone? Yes, they can. Yeah, they can. And there are um, there are some, exec- some excellent YouTube videos. Uh, Josiah Hunt has, has done them in... in um, in Hawaii he shows that, but they're all out of, again, search YouTube and the, yes, one can and one will. And there's certain different ways that one can quench it of just pouring water on it, but start off with a small, it doesn't have to be a six foot diameter. Start off something that's maybe 24 inches deep and 24, 24 inches in diameter, 24 inches deep in a, in a cone shape and play with it. And if nothing else, I mean, you can just cover it up with the dirt that you pulled out and leave the bio chart in because you can quench it with soil. And there is there are um, the minerals that the bio chart pulls from the soil. Act, there's an activation process that all happens. So when some of the time, oftentimes when they're using these large doing these large burns uh, in, in ground, they won't use water to quench it, they will actually mound dirt over it. And then when they excavate the biotrain, you've mixed in, you've got some soil, some minerals already mixed in. So you've started the process of charging your biochar. The quench is an important, yeah, the quench is an important part of the process. So let's say you get to the end, your cone is full. You're seeing that white thin ash layer form on the top. It looks like everything has burned. I want to now put it out. What, if you're using water, how do you go about that? And what else is the water doing besides just extinguishing the fire? There are a couple of things the water is doing. First of all, there are two ways of doing it. Does one want to pour the water into their kiln? Or does one, done want, one want to dump the biochar out, depending on the size of the kiln, on depending on where you're doing it? You know, on a layer that's not going to burn, maybe a piece of metal or something, or even on, even on the ground, but you will burn any grasses or stuff you might have there, and then quench it on the ground. Um, the reason I say doing that is because if you do it in your kiln, it will shorten the life of your kiln because of the oxidation of the hot, the heat, the hot metals getting hit with steam and water. Um and what the what the it starts the charging process. It opens up the pores. It starts to create the film around on the outer layer of biochar because biochar does have there's this this film um, which is which captures where where the nutrients and where where it's mined. It's not in the biochar, but it's actually encased around a film on the biochar. And so using a water quenching does do that. And I will sometimes water quench. Oftentimes when I'm out doing demonstrations in small top lit updraft stoves, I just have a larger um, uh, container, like an old popcorn can, that I will dump the biochar and put the lid on. There's no, no air. And I end up with dry charcoal then, dry biochar. But the, but and then it will need it does need to be 
put water on it at some time because water biochar is hydrophobic when, when you begin with it and it will actually float. It needs to be sit with water for a while because it will absorb quite a bit of water. And when one quenches your biochar with water, you've started the process of getting some moisture into the biochar. Let's say now you've quenched. The biochar is now sitting in the kiln. What's your preferred method or next step at that point? Do you go to reduce particle size at that point or are you looking to charge it at that point? Depending on what you've used, um, it's using some larger larger um, flame cap kilns. If you've got chunks that are three inches in diameter, I'd want to break those up a little. Um, but if you're using smaller material, you can go right to char- you right to act charging it. Um, a simple way, depending on how much you've created, when I've done it workshops with people that have used large repurposed fuel oil barrels that were five and a half feet in diameter, standing five and a half feet tall, instead of buying a large flame cap kiln. Uh, for, I know several farmers that are doing that, using material like that. And you'll end up with large pieces of material. And one of the simplest ways of breaking up that material is when you dump it on the ground, run it over with a piece of, with a tractor, run it over with your pickup, you know, and it'll break up those pieces and then charge it. I've seen people that have put this material inside like a two piece, two tarps, and then put one tarp on the, on the ground, one tarp on top, run over with the tractor, pull that tarp off. You've got, you've broken it down a little bit. And then on that tarp, they've actually charged it on the tarp where they've added moisture, maybe added in this case where we were on an island and they took five, 10 gallons of seawater, the minerals from the seawater, put that on the char, some beneficial microbes and whatever they add in their mix worm uh, worm castings and then just fold it covered it up let it sit for about four or five days and then put it into their garden now in addition to soil building benefits what are some of the other potential uses for biochar i think you were involved in a project that involved uh, landscape remediation involving some sort of pollutants using biochar the the first project first commercial project i did with this but with with this biochar was at the, um, as I said, I, I think I believe I mentioned, I get the biochar that I use from a paper mill from their steam boiler. And it is not part of the paper making process. So it's not a byproduct of, of that. So this boiler makes steam for the paper making process because they use a lot of steam. They use a lot of heat. This In, in where I live, it's a seaport town. There is a port. The port of Port Townsend is under regulations from the Department of Ecology, Washington State Department of Ecology, for the discharge. They are monitored at the amount of zinc and copper that they discharge to the bay. And zinc and copper, when I was was working there, the, the environmental compliance officer I worked with, it was interesting, but a lot of people thought it was from the bottom scraping of boats because they work on boats in, in, the, in the shipyard. And it turned out that the majority of the zinc and copper came from metal roofs. And the biggest contributor of zinc and copper was from chain link fence. Um, because, because anything that's galvanized contains zinc. That is the galvanization process. So it's that zinc and copper. So what we did was identifying what the sources were, the big sources that we that we went after, were the runoff from their corrugated metal roofs. And so we made these downspout filters out of biochar and used a couple of different blends, some of them with 80% biochar and 20% little peat pellets, and other was just pure biochar. And with either one of the filters that we used, we were able to remove, take in some cases, five over 5,000 parts per billion zinc 
and reduce it to less than 10. And which brought them, and they're allowed to to discharge something about 100, 160, depending on whether it's zinc or copper, to their waters. Well, we were able to put in these simple filters that were made out of recycled, uh, they're called IBC coats, international uh, container. Uh, they're the ones where um, um, syrups will come in and different different liquids come in. You've seen them, the metal cages with a, with a um, with a plastic liner. That's what we purposed, repurposed and used. And having one cubic yard of biochar in this filter, was, we were able to remove from about it, from up in some cases, 8,000 square foot metal roof, all the stormwater runoff, all the rainwater runoff to bring that roof into compliance. And not using, um, using point of source remediation, not putting all, it all on the soil, on the ground, and then having a big treatment facility, which is a typical engineering way of doing it. And as, a, as an engineer, that's the way we did it. But doing it as a point of source made for a simpler solution to remove their contaminations. So that's a product, a project that I've done um, they, they use it. It has been used in Colorado for mine recl reclamation, restoring the land. It's used in rain gardens. So, again, stormwater, not water, but this, yeah, it is stormwater runoff from roads or from roofs. Rain gardens that are typically mixed with compost and some wood chips. If you put in some biochar in with that mix, it will remove the hydrocarbons and zinc, because many people do not realize, but I believe, I may be off on a number, but 10% of automobile brakes are zinc. So every time you step on your brake, you're putting zinc on the pavement. And when it rains, that zinc, if you're close to a water source, ends up in the water, and the zinc really affects the fish. So yeah, it's got, and there are more and more, I'm also doing a project, this is a, a, a soil, we're getting ready to do a project with the city here that they compost all their biosolids from their wastewater treatment plant and co-composting with because the compost enhances, the biochar enhances the composting process and then measure different things in the finished compost afterwards. And there is, there is a lot of work happening with that right now in, in California because California is diverting all that food waste from your waste stream and it has to be composted. It can't get, end up in your trash. So there are a lot of different things. I'm working one project that tomorrow they're picking up some biochar is someone that has anaerobic digesters, um, a plant here in a, a company here in Seattle area. And they want to remove the smell from the process. And they're going to be running it through a biochar filter mm. because biochar activated carbon, carbon filters. Some people you can buy a composter that you put or where you can collect your compost in your kitchen and it has a charcoal filter. Well, personally, I throw biochar in my pail under my sink, which is a three gallon pail, it never smells anymore. Yeah. It absorbs the smell. So is so biochar activated carbon, same thing? Or I mean, maybe not the exact same thing, but are they perform the same? They, they can perform in similar manners. Yes, activated carbon is, it's, it's put under a certain pressure and it's treated in a different way. Um, whereas biochar, you get what you get when you do it, but there are people that are working what they call designer biochars and then post treating the biochars and making them into more of an activated charcoal. But they do have many of the same pro uh, same properties. In that point of source filtration project, were they able to test that biochar and see that those heavy metals were getting caught up in the char? Well, we have not tested them, uh, tested the actual biochar um, that, that's left in there. But we do know, so if you're pulling in 
5,000 parts per million of zinc and you're discharging less than 10. So say just for numbers, 5,000 going in and 50 going out. So 4,950 parts per million didn't just disappear. It's been absorbed to the surface of the of the, the, the biochar through that negative charging that the biochar has. Now, the bio, it's in a water bath. That water bath is there all the time. And there was one researcher, a um, Hugh McLaughlin, McLaughlin, who I sent him pictures and we were talking about it. Um, and he asked me, he says, well, in that bath, is there any, you know, is there any um, slime or there is there any algae? And I said, oh, yeah. He said, well, because the question was, how long will the biochar last in these filters? And he said it's possible that they might last for an indefinite period of time because depending upon what that algae that's in there, that algae could be feeding on the zinc and transmuting it. Because mycelia will do different things. Mushrooms will remediate in different ways. I don't know. We did not test it. One of the gentlemen that I worked with in building these what his thought was, which I would have loved to see this happen, when they he used to work in when 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 um when corrugated metal is made um is made when the the, the roof galvanizing is made, they put a charge on a sheet of metal, and then the zinc is pulled from the solution and and and, and bound to the metal. And he had worked in that process. He said, what if we put in a sheet and change the polar polarities? Can we then it we put in a lot enough of a charge to break the bond from what's on the biochar, the zinc on the biochar, and pull it off the biochar and put it on a metal plate? Right. And that was something that I think is further research is worth doing because then one could recycle zinc. One could then also re your biochar that's in these filters, these type of filters would last indefinitely. So I, I don't know. So the, the analogy to the soil here is it's holding pollutants coming off a roof. You put it into soil, it could hold stuff in the soil, good things, bad things. And it's it's locking them up in place so the biology, be it bacteria, be it fungi, whatever, now has a chance to access that versus before where it may have wanted to just uh, flow to a lower level of the soil. So you're, you're holding stuff there and then you're allowing the biology to go in and do whatever it does with that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, this has been great. I think it's filled in a lot of the gaps that I had around biochar knowledge. You know, for people out there listening to this and watching this, what's one takeaway you want them to have about biochar? It's not a mysterious element. It's something that, if you like building little campfires like you do, go ahead and make some biochar. Um, start using it. Play with it, have fun with it, um, and see see what it does. Just um, it's not a mystery. It's something that our ancestors through the millennia have been using on different continents, um, both in Northern Europe, Africa, South America, the Plains Indian. I mean, we they used they, they burned. And that burn was making was creating some biochar. It's something that's in our DNA, and I think we've forgotten it. Well, it's been great, Francesco. For people that want to learn more about the work that you're doing, where's the best place to go? Well, I would say that you can go to my website, which is olympicbiochar.com. It's pretty minimalistic um, on, on that website. Well, we will be putting up some um, 
some links, but I would start with a few places. I would start with the International Biochar Initiative. Um, just search that. Look at the U U.S. Biochar Initiative. And from both those places, there are links to um, a myriad of, of information um, where, where one can go. And as open as I am in, in talking with you today, if anyone reached out to me from my website, I have a resource state, resource sheet, simple sheet that will, there are great videos that are out there, um, some that I like, and I'd be happy to share that with anyone. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out some of the great clips and watch the full interviews right here on In Search of Soil.